MCR studio. It's been a long weekend, and it's only the second day. I'm joined here by uh, the bestie, the doll, Pressure Point. How are you? I'm so good, baby. How are you? I'm doing so good. Welcome to the studio. Thank you for having me. It's a lovely studio. I love the setup, all the gear. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I got it all set up just for you. So I wanted to get into kind of just like the root of it all. I kind of want to grow, like, because you are a Florida boy. There's not too many of them around here. And so I kind of wanted to get into it first, talking about sort of like your musical upbringing. Talk to me about growing up South Florida and all of the sounds that you were hearing as you were, you know, just sort of creating a musical identity. What did that look like for you growing up? Okay, so... On my mother's side, I am fourth generation Floridian. My mom's from here, my grandmother's from here, mm -hmm. my great grandmother came here in like the early 1900s. Mm -hmm. On my father's side, I'm first generation Haitian, mm -hmm. and I'm from Lake Worth, Florida. Mm -hmm. So, I, I, for me, I think where because I'm from Palm Beach County, there is a cultural identity that is like a mosh posh of things. Mm -hmm. So it's Caribbean, it's Southern, it's black as hell, it's all of these different like things. So I feel like I'm a collection of honestly everything that was brought up in my house. So I grew up with a lot of dance hall, a lot of Southern hip hop because my father, my, I grew up with my stepfather who mm -hmm. is Bahamian, but also from Florida. Mm -hmm. So he loved everything that was coming out of Houston and Texas. Uh, of course, I have older aunts that are like kind of like my big sister. So they would date, of course. Mm -hmm. And everyone kind of, I feel like in Florida wants to be a rapper at some point. Yeah. So all the music that they were making, a lot of like Florida hip hop, jug. So yeah, it's like a mosh posh of things. Yeah, and so that's that's great that you mentioned that just because like, you know, a large part of my upbringing, upbringing as well, we're both like Caribbean boys. My parents are both like Puerto Rican. They're like from Puerto Rico. So I know like a big part of like my experience growing up and too, like I'm originally from Orlando as well. So there's like a little bit of that like suburbanness of it too. And there was also that, point in time in Florida because I feel like I grew up my mom was listening to like a lot of freestyle and there was like just like a lot of like electronic music happening in Orlando in the 90s and that had like a big influence of what I was growing up with but then all of a sudden I feel like at like the turn of the millennium Florida had this really massive pivot towards hip-hop so I feel like a lot of my childhood and adolescence is like marked by all of this hip hop. And then it was like, you know, the upcoming reggaeton movement that had just started too. And my mom was sending me to Puerto Rico in the summers as well. And so it just, it was all of, did you have like a similar journey where it's like, oh, well, you know, at one point I was listening to a bunch of electronic music, but now all of a sudden I was listening to a lot of hip hop. And now all of a sudden that like, do you have that similar journey? I think so. Like in general, like we kind of like chameleon, like depending on our surroundings. So the music I was listening to at school was completely different from the music I was listening to with my big sister. Mm -hmm. And the music I'm listening to when I'm riding around in the car with my mom is completely different from what I'm listening to with my grandmother. Mm -hmm. So it's all of these different, like I said, I feel like we're all collections of all the sounds we've ever heard. Mm -hmm. And I try to showcase that within my music. Yeah, absolutely. And then so kind of we've evolved and then you grew up. And then so what was sort of like your induction into the scene like when did you start going out where were you going out what were those like early early experiences that kind of molded you and kind of gave you this insight as to wow i kind of want to be in this space i want to operate in this space and i want to start creating culture in this space so i think for me i grew up a dancer i started to dance professionally at 13. so i would be on the dance teams. A lot of us would compete from like all the dance crews in West Palm would compete with all the dance crews in Miami. I think that's just always a thing. Like Palm Beach is kind of battling between the other counties. So I started to dance back up for drag queens. Mm -hmm. So I, my natural progression was stopping through all the counties. So left Palm Beach to go dance at like 13, 15, sneaking into Wilton Manor. Yeah. So all the gay clubs. And then also this is the same era of like, everybody's getting into Daft Punk. It was mm -hmm. a lot. Of yeah, that Bloghouse era. Cascada, yep. like all the things. So 
yeah, that was really like my first intro into, okay, I kind of want to make a, I see something in this that I, is reflective. Mm -hmm. Once I turned 18 or so, I like literally right after high school, I went to Art Basel. So this was like 2013. So yeah, this is yeah, yeah, I remember. very, very early on, like Art Basel was not commercially making a name for itself yet, but it was bubbling. So that completely changed everything for me. I fell in love with Miami that mm -hmm. very moment and just saw that, yeah, like there is a life that I can have in art and culture. So that inspired me to do shit in my own hometown. So I started throwing events. I had this party called Respectable. Well, the club was called Respectable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I had a party called Shenanigans. Oh my gosh, that's so cute. I love Respectable. Yeah. It's, the, it's the goth club of Palm Beach, if yeah. y'all don't know. It's so <laughs> cute. It's so cute. So I, like, talk to me about like, you know, like meeting Ashley and then, you know, all of a sudden there was an idea where Miss Cece was going to be born from. Like, t talk to me about like that exchange where there was a conversation and it's like, you know, we need to put something on for the community, you know, mm -hmm. and talk about like, you know, we can have a nightlife event, but it's also for the culture and it's also bringing together all of these people who are such brilliant artists to making something that's so culturally impactful? So I think, um, well, there's so many origin stories to that one, but it really actually birthed between conversations between and me and my friend Helen, who's also mm -hmm. the founder of, mm -hmm. uh, of FemPower. So me and her, we stayed together. We used to live together um, as literally she's my best friend. So we would just lay up at night and just dream of all these different things and I would share my experiences. Cause I think in general, like where people like to make Miami be this separate thing from Florida, but as we can see from yeah. like elections, Miami is very Florida. It's very, so, very Indian. <laughs> so I, I like, you cannot erase that history of segregation. So we grew up going to gay clubs. Like I said, I mm -hmm. got my start in gay clubs. But even in those spaces, I did not care for the music, didn't care to be fetishized, didn't care right. to be the me and my friends being the only black folks there. So we would go to the black gay clubs. Mm -hmm. So Club Boy, Cloud Nine, yep. but also I didn't feel completely accepted in those spaces either because I'm coming from a different, my blackness is not, I feel like a lot of people do this blanketed thing where just because you show up in the world a certain way that you have to act a certain way. Right. So I, yeah, I think that we're way more complex than that. And like I said, I was deeply inspired by like the art movement that was happening in Miami at that time. So all the queer parties, that's when I'm getting introduced to all the queer parties that are happening here. Yep. So the double stubbles, mm -hmm. the counterculture, all of my friends, we would drive down to go to these events and then just other friends that were throwing cool shit just really like inspired us to be like, you know what? I wanna have something that is for us, by us, and also our participation Absolutely. within from power. Activism is always kind of at like the core mm -hmm. of the work and the whole point for us was trying to find a way to intertwine art in activism. So it was kind of like the perfect segue to do yeah, that. Yeah, absolutely. And so now that, you know, fast forward to now, and now you, there's been quite a few Miss Eces and it's become sort of like, I feel like a, a Miami cultural mainstay. Now you have like the un unique opportunity as well to be traveling the world and sort of be carrying that platform with you wherever you go. What's kind of like your, your, your ethos to DJing when you're traveling, you know, like, what, how, what, how does the Sonic experience, like what, what are you trying to bring to people with every location that you go to? Literally, like I said earlier, that I am a representation of sonically of all the sounds I've ever heard. Mm -hmm. So the emotions of R&B music, whether it be lyrical or just like the rhythm of it from house music, specifically like Afro house and soul and just everything that I'm hearing in Miami and just the stuff that all the artists that we have here, I try to make it a point when I'm out in the world to showcase this is what we play here. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I kind of take that with me. And how's the response been to that? Amazing, because yeah, Florida has a little bit of reputation in the world, mm -hmm. thanks to social media. Yeah, absolutely. So it, it's kind of cool to be from a place that is infamous, mm -hmm. so yeah. Definitely. So what's what's the future hold for you kind of going into 2023? What are your goals? How do you want to grow Miss Cece? How do you want to grow yourself? Yeah, so I think I've been really trying to 
figure that out for the most part. Like my CC and me as pressure point, Akaya, like those, they intertwine, but those are like separate identities. Mm -hmm. So I want to give those spaces just do. So definitely like figuring out other ways to conjure up ways to create more black spaces, reimagine what black spaces look like for collective gathering. I'm interested in seeing more daytime things. Mm -hmm. Us, I feel like a lot of our work is so centered around nightlife, yep. but I'm not a vampire. So <laughs> <laughs> I enjoy like, and, and I just, I, where I want to showcase the breathy of all of, yeah, what I have to offer. So yeah, in the Masisi space, doing more stuff that is more in a different form of community, not just mm -hmm. in the club. I want to see movies. Yeah. I want to cook in a gathering yeah. situation. I want to share more of what that means as a culture and for pressure point. Yeah, I want to play all around the world. I want to play all around. I want to have residencies everywhere. Yeah. I want to get into radio. I want to get into presenting. And yeah, I think that's what it's giving like for all of us for this scene. I think we're all working so hard and I think, you know, that's for the future. I think everybody has like a really good like upward trajectory. Yeah. And I like thank you for like sitting down with me and, and getting to share your story with me. Like, you know, that's so important. I do think like, you know, you're one of Miami's brightest stars and I think like you're really going to go places. Yeah, I appreciate that, Alex, especially coming from you. Oh. Another bright star. <laughs> thank you so much. So do you want to play a game? Yeah. Okay, so every time we're out, we're always bonding over R&B divas. So we're going to play <laughs> a little game. So I collected five divas. They're not very obscure. You don't have to dig super deep. It's no, nobody super underground. These are all very, very popular, lovely divas. And so basically, I've compiled some facts on them. And so basically, I'm going to start off giving you a hint. It's a very, very vague hint. You could buy another hint. You got to take a sip of tequila, though. Okay. So we'll see if you can get each of these hip-hop and R&B divas. Okay, so this first diva in 1991 was part of an all-female R&B group called FaZe. Mm, called FaZe. Oh, you stopped me with that one. I Hold mean, up. remember these these first these first clues are very very vague, so you can still guess, but you could also buy another hint with a sip of tequila. All right, I'll take the tequila shot. All right, take a tequila shot. All right, cool. Sorry, I didn't have like a glass. Like it's everything so was very fire. put together. Come on, bless you. <laughs> 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 So this diva worked together with another extremely popular hip hop producer, and together they created a songwriting and production team. Oh, Missy Elliott. Bam. Yeah. Uh, when you said Phase, I already kind of knew because, like, I was recently doing some research on her. But yeah. Virginia all right. We're, we're that was right. We're moving on to our next diva. This diva is the only uh, female artist in the history of the Hot 100 to have 18 consecutive top 10 uh, single hits. Mariah Carey? Nope. Take a shot for another hint. Damn. 18 consecutive. This is an R&B? Uh, yep. Now, when this diva was 16 years old. Beyonce. Nope. Damn. Her dad arranged for her debut album in 1982. Oh, Whitney Houston. Nope. All right, take one more Damn. for the last okay. for the last come hit. On. Come on, come on! Don't you can't be too hasty. She is one of six children of this famous clan. Oh, Janet Jackson. Yep. All right, next diva. So this diva was in an on-again, off-again relationship with Lil Wayne from 2005 to 2007. 2005, 2007. R&B diva. Lil no, no, not a, this one's not an R&B diva. This one's like a hip-hop diva. Oh, Trina? Yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah. Damn, I really thought I was going to stump you with that one. <laughs> All right, next diva. Okay, so uh, in October of 2013... This diva went 
uh, on her very first tour with Little Dragon, with their first show being at the El Rey Theater in Los Angeles. Repeat it one more time. In 2013, this diva went on her very first tour ever with okay. Little Dragon, and her first show was on October 17th in Los Angeles. Is this Kalela? Nope. Nope. Mm. But in that realm, though, this is an R&B diva. Okay. In that realm, R&B diva. Shit. Have a sip for another hint. Come on. Mm-hmm. Okay, so uh, this diva worked alongside Rihanna to co-write Consideration on Anti. Oh, SZA. Yep. Yes. All right, last diva. And then we got a one-hour set by Pressure Point. All right, so in June 20th of 2003, this diva had $250,000 worth of jewelry stolen from her on a flight from JFK. Oh, hold up. Say it one more time. In June 20, 2003, this diva had $250,000 worth of jewelry stolen from her on a flight from JFK. Are they like an overall diva or this is like a musical diva? This is a musical diva as well. Damn. Okay. Hip hop or? Hip hop. Hip hop. Shit. $250,000. I would say a little Ken. Oh my God. <laughs> that was just the lucky <laughs> guess. All right. Well, that concludes that. Thank you again for tuning into another episode of Chains Addiction. We're going to finish us off by a one hour set by Pressure Point. Pressure Point, thank you so much for being here with us today. And let's get it popping. Thank you for having me. All right. <laughs>